uh, the, the federal universal health care. <laughs> um, it's an abomination. Uh, I, I, and pun intended, but it, it really is an abomination. It, it, number one, and this does this isn't just health care. I mean, I'll use the health care, but I'll, I'll use the other other issues of redistribution of wealth and control that we're talking about, um, because that's what it is. You know, it's a mandate, but it also is a redistribution of wealth. It's a lot of things. Here, so when we talk about health care or anything else that's a redistribution of wealth, I can tell you that I'm opposed to it. Uh, Number one, the feds have absolutely no authority to be involved in health care, even if it's a proper and, and role of government, which it's not. But even if it were, the federal government has no authority. The limitation on the federal government is very, very clear. Of course, they don't have any authority for most of the things they do, education and health care and all the other things they get involved in, and, and they, they try to get us to buy into because these things are found in the penumbra of the Constitution. Um, that's ridiculous, and it's absurd, and it's... Uh, the, uh, the health care specifically, it's, uh, the problem that I have with it is that number one, it's unconstitutional at the federal level. Number two, it's a direct mandate on the private sector. Where in the history of this country have we been forced to buy a product? We're not. Even in, ins even in car insurance, you're not forced. If you own a car, the state forces you, which I don't necessarily agree with. But you, don't, you aren't forced under any circumstance to, to buy a product or to pay a fine. This is the first time. So we have a direct mandate on the people in, to buy a product. That sets a precedence that scares me, quite frankly, that what is the next product that we're going to have to buy under the strong arm of the law and, and the enforcement of the, by the government. That's a frightening proposition. But in general, the redistribution of wealth, and now I'm going to go from there to, to, to the redistribution of wealth. Government at all levels are prohibited from doing that, from, from redistributing wealth. can answer that in three simple questions. Where does government derive its authority and its power? From the people, right? Anybody in this room disagree? Can the people delegate more authority than they have? Absolutely not. Do the people have the authority to redistribute wealth? Absolutely not. Therefore, they cannot delegate authority that they don't have to a government. So the redistribution of wealth, entitlements, uh, mandates like that, all those are, are unconstitutional on their face. But we have become so, we become so enamored with the idea that government's going to solve all of our problems that we, we have lost sight of, of that limitation. So I, I oppose all of them. As a follow-up, would you fight to keep it out of the state? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I will do whatever I can. I absolutely loved my experience in Washington, D.C. It was, it was a fabulous experience. Where else can you study the practice of law and business and be able to go to the Supreme Court and actually, actually see what happens there? Nowhere. I mean, this is it. Um, I, I was able to uh, to intern for Orrin Hatch when he was on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I mean, a fabulous experience. So, my experience there was was just absolutely wonderful. Um, it, the it is it is the 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 seat of the free world. You can feel it when you drive in. I don't know if you've ever been there, but when you go into D.C., you can just feel it. But the history that's there, the founding fathers. I mean, I I love the founding fathers, and I am a I am a traditional constitutionalist. I, I don't buy all, like I said, you probably gathered that by me being, making comments about the holdings found in the penumbra of the Constitution. Um, I, I, I think that uh, being there affirmed the values that I have as I studied the history of, of the area, as I went to the different places and, and studied the history. I've read the original documents, but to go in and be able to see them is it was just a, a thrill for me, just remarkable. It was also a point where we were able, even though we were, we were starving students, uh, I went to law school with five kids, came out with six, um, starving students, but we, we took day trips and went different places and, and we were able to go up to Philadelphia and into in Independence Hall and that entire area. Uh, I can tell you that the rich history that exists there it, and it is, is just, 
um, inspiring. What, what is difficult for me is what I consider to be the bastardization of that history. And to have, have the idea that, uh, that our founding fathers were these bad men. I mean, this revisionist history that they were, that they were drunken womanizers who never did anything right. You know, they were men, they had weaknesses. But they, they were a great, great generation. Take someone like Washington, who, who was willing to give up the power that he could have had, or to recognize he had to be under the civil, the civil authority. And I won't, I won't bore you with all the details of Valley Forge, but that was, that was a decision to essentially, we're going to, I'm just gonna take a moment if I can, kind of talk about George Washington, is that okay? This, is, this shows the Founding Fathers. Sorry, I'm passionate about this, but this shows the Founding Fathers. You have a guy like George Washington who was the head of the army, could have gone anywhere he wanted to winter quarters after being beaten pretty severely by the British, but the Congress wanted him to go to Valley Forge. There was nothing there. And so he petitioned to go to a town that was already in existence, and the Congress said no. They wanted him at Valley Forge. So they had these emaciated soldiers who had no shoes, who, whose clothes were tattered, Many of them didn't have weapons and they were emaciated, had to build their own huts from the ground up because Washington understood that when the military took over, you no longer had a recipe for freedom. So he was willing to subject himself and his men to the hardships of Valley Forge to maintain that decorum and that principle of freedom and, and, and being under civil, uh, the civil authorities. So those are the things you learn back there. Those are the things that you see and you witness, uh, albeit looking back in history, but um, it helped to, to define the person that I am and to, to understand and to cherish the freedoms and liberties that I now fight for. Always been, involved, always been <clears throat> interested in business and this was no different. I went to George Washington University and decided I wanted to, to practice business law, corporate law. So I did, I went in house with a company called Orange Sol. I came out at a time when, when in Arizona, in, in Phoenix, uh, it, it was uh, 91 and it was right after the big real estate bust of the late 80s, early 90s. And it was tough to find a job. I, I was fortunate enough to be able to get a job there and, and work there for 12 years. Uh, even though I had others that made me offers uh, after things kind of turned around, it was a, a great experience and I enjoyed it because I was able to do, to, to, to dabble both in the business and in the law. And so it was a, it was a great fit for me. And uh, I did that for 12 years and then I just had too much going on. I started the schools uh, 15 years ago and did that really out of a labor of love, never intended to, to, for it to be a full-time job, but it grew into a full-time job. And so probably when I was elected to be the majority leader, that was an additional very, very time-consuming responsibility. And so I decided to go on sabbatical for a couple of years and I just never got back. So I enjoyed it, it was a great experience, but I enjoy what I'm doing now. <laughs>